Okay, um, let's go ahead and uh, get started again. Um, so uh, I'm very excited, uh, like other presenters, I have more questions than answers here, but I do, have, I do have some things I'm thinking about and working on. And as we go through the presentation, it gets more and more nebulous, uh, just ideas rather than actual implementations. But um, so I want to talk about three separate things re related to boot time, measuring and testing and stuff like that. So I always throw the abstract in just for future readers. So I'm going to talk about uh, boot markers, uh, boot phases, and automated optimizations. In the actual title that's in, uh, in the uh, schedule, I call it profile guided, but that was, that's, not, that's a very specific term. It's really, I learned earlier this week that it should be feedback directed optimization. Um, so let's start with boot markers. And this actually plays right along with what Lara was already talking about, which is, um, well, just introduction. I don't think I need to go through this. Uh, to do regression testing, um, there's lots of uh, instrumentation and tools that Laura talked about, uh, but there's no actual test of boot time, right? So it's a little bit like a, there's a weight loss clinic and all they've got there is a mirror, right? So. Uh, that does, that's not that helpful to, to tell, you know, what exactly is wrong, where I need to fix things. Um, so I think we need to pick a consistent set of time durations in the kernel to measure and report those, decide on what it is we want to uh, report. So we already talked about the fact that init calls have too many. They vary a lot per, by different systems. Uh, they're not comprehensive. Print K messages depend a lot on config. If you're doing the serial console, you'll get a lot of extra, extra overhead and outputting those. Um, and uh, they're not fixed strings. Um, but I do think that it's useful to talk about standardizing kind of the regions of boot that we want to measure. Um, uh, I think it would be useful just in order to collaborate, even if we're on different machines, to be able to talk about you know, how much time did memory take to initialize? And how was, how was it dependent on the size of memory on a particular system? Um, so I'd like to come up with a tractable number of data points and with good kind of what I call cohesion of the data. So, you know, what, what things are kind of correlated to each other. And also, who can, who, who, what subsets can, can we blame for our problems and report regressions to? Um, so I have, there's a couple different proposed markers and methods. So Laura was doing uh, trace events. Uh, I am actually proposing uh, print case statements. Um, at, but I think that there are other mechanisms and I think we ought to have a system that works no matter which output mechanism you choose. So I can imagine uh, there's things like early, early serial port access or on some boards you have GPIO that you can do really fast and it's not gonna cause overhead on the system. Um, so I'd like, and I'd also like to use the same style of markers for the bootloader phase, the kernel phase, and user space, right? So that you can get a more holistic view of what's going on. Um, and it'd be nice if we could use the same markers with multiple measuring tools. Um, and I, so in order to reduce overhead, I'd like it, you to be able to reduce the marker size to a very short string. Um, and uh, it'd be nice if the markers were human readable and automation friendly. So this is what I came up with, boot markers, uh, which is a uh, three, have three parts, a prefix, a number, and a string. Uh, boot marker is one of B for bootloader, K for kernel, U for user space, numbers one through nine, and we can talk about whether that's too restrictive to just have nine regions, um, and then a string indicating the region name. So. The rationale for this is that uh, if we're trying to restrict the overhead of uh, measuring that on like print K when you're going over serial console, uh, then you can reduce that to just the, the, the two digit uh, number, uh, the prefix and number, and it's only two characters going to the serial port. Uh, well, three if you count the line feed. But, um, uh, and so I had actually did some testing where I added boot marker uh, so I made a new routine in the kernel called boot marker that takes those and I put it in init.main and I called it from some places. And, and this is the problem. I just, I picked some arbitrarily and I gave them names. I don't know if they're the right ones. Uh, that's, so this is, this is the output from a boot marker. 
uh, from print K with the uh, D message output with the boot markers enabled. I put them at critical level, log level, and you can see the timing duration. Uh, this is the start time for each of those, right? So, but, and I did, okay, so the one thing I kind of cheated on was I made K8 not a single region. I made it for each of the init call levels. So K8 has, I don't know, eight levels or something like that. Um, and so there's a couple of flaws you can see already just by looking at this, is that the sketch clock doesn't come on until you're a little ways in. So that's a problem. Um, uh, hence my question in the earlier presentation. Uh, but what I have done to deal, to deal with a lot of these issues, so there's a tool that someone reminded me about just in the break. Grab, I use a tool called Grab Serial to grab the data from the serial port as things are coming up. And so as long as I'm getting serial output, I can do this measurement across the, the, um, the bootloader and, and across the kernel and across the user space. Uh, as long as the messages are coming out in a timely manner. And there is an issue with during the early kernel startup, uh, the kernel messages get uh, uh, buffered and, until the console is initialized. So that's an issue that you kind of have to compensate for. But, um, uh, and, uh, but I've recently, mod uh, most people don't know that there's this tool that's already in the kernel called show delta. It's in the kernel scripts directory and it is used to show the delta between two times, or it can be used to show the delta between two times in a, a print k times formatted uh, D message output. So I made some slight modifications to it and so that you could pass it a string and now it can measure a bunch of regions in the kernel uh, and in my case, I, I'm putting my string marker as boot marker and now I've got durations for those regions. So it's between each boot marker output statement, I get a, a region, and, uh, and then I've got, I, I, you have to have seen my earlier presentation today, but this is in KTOP format. These are the metrics for the duration, and then I can convert this, uh, these unknown test case outputs into pass or fail based on a reference value file that I've got. Okay, so that's boot markers. Um, that was real quick. Uh, any, any, any comments on that? I've only got about 10 minutes per, per thing, so. So there's a very old thing uh, used in x86 uh, debugging that is basically writing on the now abused port 80, uh, which was used for the very early initialization of the system because it's available right from the, even in the boot block. So you can uh, time everything. Well, are you talking about the TMC instruction? No, no, no. I'm or talking about port 80. Oh, port 80. It's used to measure, it can be used to measure timing even when you have no memory. Oh, okay. Okay, that's good to know. Okay. Go here. You can avoid the buffering at the start using early print K, but that not be able, might not be able, available on your platform. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Early print K. That's good. For how useful is it to provide the init calls when you have like uh, async probing and uh, stuff? So there's not. Y yes. Yeah, you might not have a one-to-one -one relation anyway. Yes. What, one of the things I discovered, I, I don't know if you noticed that, but. Uh, a lot of a lot of init calls do a deferred probe or do a probe that gets deferred, and so you have this one init call deferred deferred probe init call or something like that 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 has all this other stuff. So I need I would need to go in and account for that separately. Uh, I probably do something like that in my init call duration test because that's related to that specific uh, kind of boot technology. Uh, probably not won't be able to account for it in boot markers. But, but that deferred probe comes out in one of the phases, and so you can kind of know that that phase might be variable depending on. I think that I would be most interested in the duration of each probe function. Um, okay. But that would mean you need a lot of identifiers. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's, yeah, so uh, it's hard to know how granular to get, <laughs> and that, that is a discussion that would be really good to have. Um, one of the things I've 
try to use debugging hetero heterogeneous systems. It's also uh, ARM debuggers, uh, debug subsystem sometimes has to, uh, depending on the SOC, right? System trace macro cells, STM. So you could kind of write messages to it, and they are timestamped, and you can read it later on. And so is that is that an ARM specific thing? ARM sixty four, yes. Okay. System trace macro cell. Okay. I I don't know if you there'll be others uh, in other architecture. Yeah, as well. it's hard to find something that works across you know any platform. I was going to kind of echo the same thing. So that exists. I mean, you can use the M timer in Risk Five for that. It's cycle accurate. <clears throat> but one of the big concerns that I would have especially if you get down to very specific things, like if you've got a PCI accelerator or something like that, uh, where like the, the, even the variance between measurements could dwarf, or like your print K could dwarf the actual yeah. measurement. Uh, well, I found that. If I don't put quiet on the command line, the print K times dwarfs the, yeah. the init call times. So, uh, and then in that case, the, uh, the hardware-based uh, uh, debug print, and tra or the bug trace uh, things are actually pretty, pretty useful. Yeah, they are, but they're ma machine specific and so platform on your specific. first slide, you definitely you said like we'll have to support multiple things. So even GPIO is like yeah. really good that way. I'm I'm very I'm I really <laughs> want to look into the trace clock issue to see if that helps out some. We only have like time for one more question because I got two more two more categories of stuff to talk about. Uh, okay, really quick, uh, why are we focusing on serial? Love? I know it's, uh, bootloaders have serial. Is there a reason we can't do that part in serial and then once you get into the kernel, not depend on serial? Is there a reason it has to be serial? Uh, like why limit ourselves? What's the lim like? It's what I've got on my board and it's universal. Like I said, I think it'd be useful to, but it's hard to find something that's universal, right? Yeah, um, my point is once you get into the kernel, it feels like this is overcomplicating it. Just use the normal logging or trace points to well, profile. Well, okay, so, but the serial is working across the bootloader and user space, right? Which is not true of, is going to be true of any other Correct. tracing mechanism. Correct, but maybe we can figure that part out a common way to pass that information from the bootloader to the kernel. Yeah, so I that mean, can there's, been, log there's those been work things. on, like, sharing the tracing log between, uh, the tracing buffer between uh, U-boot and the kernel. But again, that's only one firmware, and so there's, this was, this is kind of a least common denominator approach that I found worked. Yeah, I, my, my only worry is it becomes too low of a denominator, <laughs> where the UR writing itself is going to mask anything. I don't know, that's my, uh, well, but we don't need to stall like, on that. I mean, we can if you only got three characters per marker and 10 markers, uh, you can figure out the overhead. It's not that bad. So anyway, I, I don't want to over- I don't want to derail it so I can continue. <laughs> okay, I got to move on. So boot phases, uh, this is, this is, uh, what I want to do here is divide the boot into two main phases, uh, the critical and the non-critical phase, and see if we can do a bunch of stuff in the critical phase to get the, uh, those use cases that Kasim was talking about, get to those use cases up and running before we start a bunch of other junk, right? You know, System D has like, uh, I don't know, 400 services it wants to start up. Um, and so the idea is to do only the essential initializations during the critical part of the boot phase. Um, and uh, what this means is allowing deferred initializations. So the kernel already supports some mechanisms to defer initialization. The most obvious one is module loading, right? You can l declare your driver as a module and then load it sometime later. Uh, there's, no, there's no kind of easy mechanisms exi in existing RC systems or, or system D systems to identify individual drivers and where they should be in the, in the thing. But there, it's possible to do things like that. So what kinds of things can be deferred? And I'm going to argue at least two things that I'm aware of. Um, and uh, so deferred init calls and memory initialization. Maybe you didn't know that you could defer init calls. Well, there's this really obscure patch that I used at Sony t like uh, t 10 to 15 years ago called the Deferred Init Calls patch. I recently uh, up uh, uh, updated it to the 6.11 kernel, and I, and I made it so it wasn't, it was really janky back then. So uh, I have a patch that I'll send up if, if there's enough interest uh, that puts the init call on a deferred list and then calls it later. Okay, um, I, I, and I'll, I'll try to preempt what I, I assume to be the most obvious questions, 
uh, is this safe at all? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> actually, okay, here's the thing. My answer is actually it is. If you're using a device tree based system, you can do 100% asynchronous probing. We do that on a Pixel 6, for example. We do parallelized module loading. So all of the things that they think are scary will actually work well because I implemented over a couple of years, through a couple of years, implement, sorry, implemented firmware doubling that basically makes your init call ordering completely irrelevant. You right. can put your consumer as the first init call and the supplier as the last init call. Everything will be stable. It will work properly. So please give it a shot. Okay. There's actually a command line parameter. I gave a talk about it yesterday. There's a command line parameter to say, by default, do every probing to be asynchronous. Give that a shot. Okay. I think you'll see that cut the probing time by half in my use case. Yeah, I talked to, I talked to Bjorn. I don't know if Bjorn's here, but uh, he said he had Mike mixed experiences with async probing. Uh, so. I think that uh, we can uh, say that some of the uh, int codes uh, can be deferred uh, by uh, itself. Uh, so that are, this means that are if we are, for example, the tracing, tracing most of the, the case, uh, we don't uh, trace that are the boot time. So that in that case, the most of or all of the tracing uh, initialization can be deferred. Yeah, I found a couple that I tested just quickly uh, that deferred no problem. My impression, okay, so if you look at the init call phases, the last one is called late init call, right? And my impression is that almost all the stuff in late init call is, uh, I mean, it's, it's intended to be loaded after a bunch of other stuff has been set up, the clocks, the power, the memory, uh, yeah. the, you know, the RAM buffers, the allocators. Uh, the, so yeah. that stuff seems to be pretty safe, but you'd want to test it. So let me just say real quick, so I think part of this idea is to give people confidence that it's okay, we need to do some analysis and maybe say, look, here's the list of init calls that we, th we think are pretty safe for you to defer. Uh, but like if you, know, go, if you wander out in the weeds and try something that's in the, one of the early init calls, okay, I, you know, you're on your own. Yeah, so that are, uh, the, I think that the, the command line, uh, this uh, what's it, style will not be uh, acceptable because that are, it is very dangerous. Yeah, but but uh, each init call can uh, was it declare that uh, which one uh, was it what kind of oh. or yeah uh, oh, that's the idea. condition uh, it need to or uh, was it it can default or it need to or be this timing or something okay. like that. Okay, okay, jot that down. So uh, if the uh, init call itself kind of uh, declared that it was safe for different. Actually, honestly, I would say if most of your init call delay is coming from device drivers. Don't even yeah. bother trying to deal with reordering init calls. Yeah. All you should be doing there is registering a driver's little one function call, shouldn't take any time, and defer everything, do asynchronous probing. All of that already works, don't re reinvent the wheel. Just do driver async probe equal to star. That'll well, defer every probing. Well, but you're still gonna, I mean, if you have a critical code path, if it's listed as an init call, it's gonna call it, right? So it's Yeah, but if the init call is just dry, registering the driver, you don't do the actual probing. You do the probing separately. Well, but you'd have to have a mechanism to tell the driver, right, that I don't want you to, as soon as, I don't want you to run as soon as you can, I want you to run. I'm saying there's a command, I'm saying there's a command line for that. Oh, is there? Okay. It's exactly, okay. yeah. That's good to know. I got to talk to you offline. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. You're reinventing a lot of stuff. It's all done. There's a couple of issues with this. Uh, this is just one of the techniques, like, uh, there, you, you have to, there's some issues with when do you free init memory. Um, some init calls may be dependent on others. That, that goes into the safety issue. Um, I think a lot of those in the late stage or the driver stage could probably be deferred, um, but we need testing. Um, deferred memory initializations. There was a good talk, a uh, really good talk at um, Open Source Summit in North America about uh, deferring the memory initialization, so bringing up just the first uh, like one gig or two gig of memory and then deferring the uh, execution of the remaining memory uh, until later, so that's another thing that could be deferred. Um, and then I think uh, I'd like to look at, I haven't looked at yet, but how, how you could go about, if you're gonna have these different boot phases, how you, how you can identify something as being in the critical phase versus the non-critical phase uh, for, uh, so that's probably some system unit ordering and modification of the dependency graph there. Um, that's about all I got on that. Uh, so. Are any, any last comments on that before I move on to my final thing? 
Try to do parallelized module loading, please. What, try to try to load modules in parallel. Okay. That will help. That helps a ton too. Okay. Uh, somebody has a here. Uh, there is uh, two things. Uh, first, uh, init ng used to be focused on doing that exactly. Uh, the second thing is, for some reason, kmod is uh, the, the the command line utility, not the library. I don't know exactly where the, the problem is. Uh, fails to load in parallel. If you call it several times at once uh, in parallel, it uh, some of the calls succeed and some fail. Is I that, didn't check why. Is that mod probe or is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's I don't know why yet. I didn't debug it. Okay. Unfortunately, I gotta I gotta keep moving because uh, it looked like I only had one thing left, but I really have two. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk about the the most controversial and least developed idea that I have, uh, which is a boot cache, a statically compiled pre-initialization, and a boot time tuning tool. So um, what I want to do is automate the pre-initialization of the kernel. And uh, so at a philosophical level, pre-initialization means I want to figure out what the hardware is going to look like before the kernel runs and, uh, and modify the kernel to be custom for that hardware. Um, that means that there's a couple of ways to do that. Um, so the problem with that, right, is if you specialize the kernel for a particular piece of hardware, you can't get the changes upstream, right? They're not general enough to share with other people. It goes completely against the whole notion of uh, GKI and, and other initiatives, the device tree initiatives, to make it so that you can have a single kernel image that runs on multiple machines. Um, but I, I still want to give it a go. I want to see if it's possible to automate that. There's no way it's tractable for an individual developer to go in and make it all these specializations. Um, and so what I'm proposing is something I'm calling a boot cache. So I want to record the values from one boot and then use them to reproduce the time in subsequent boots. Only it's not a runtime thing, it's a compile time thing. I want to record the values and then actually uh, substitute in, uh, let's see, the, this the thing. So during the record phase, I want to add a kernel command line that says you're in this mode where you're recording data. And then uh, I want to actually extract that recorded data, turn it into hard-coded macros that then the drivers can use to compile out the portions that they're not going to use. Okay, so I want to actually do it at the compiler level. So I think there's a question over here. Um, I'm actually kind of... Uh, uh, I'm um, happy that you, you mentioned that because from the Zephyr uh, side, which is where I'm coming from these days, uh, we actually do something really similar to that. So we have in device tree, you can get a dependency graph quite easily there. Uh, if things are disabled, then you just don't boot them automatically. You don't load them automatically, the drivers. But then we also have per uh, bus effectively, like an, an initialization priority. So you've got clocks with the highest priority and then you'll have something like, uh, you know, memory controllers and then you'll have, uh, you like, uh, you'll eventually get to your I squared C buses and then your peripherals on those buses. Those uh, NIT priorities are actually in K config and they can be modified on a per board level because occasionally there are outliers. But what's great about this is you get a, a completely, um, uh, predetermined, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's always going to be the same. Deterministic. Yeah, it's, deterministic. It's always deterministic. It's, it's like a guarantee. You can actually, at runtime, you can verify that it has booted deterministically, uh, you know, by, by flagging that option as right. enabled. So it's, it's, it's been working for us really well for like at least a year now. Yeah, so uh, the idea for this actually came from the Zephyr thing. <laughs> so, I, and I don't know if it can translate into the kernel or not, because we're ta I'm talking about like taking, you know, git of platform or git, uh, git property, and if I can replace that git property with a, like, oh, it's a four, you know, use a four. Yeah, it's compile time constant, so it should op actually optimize the code as well. I don't know if it's possible though, because device trees deals with a lot with pointers, 
And you have to make sure the pointers are deterministic if you're going to do this type of thing. Okay, there's a question here and then over there. Are you sure you're not reinventing hibernation? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, you, I'm not sure at all. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't, I don't you, you do you do a you do a boot, you hibernate, you keep that image as like the golden hibernation image, and you always dehibernate well, from that the, image, and it's the di the difference exactly is that, that I didn't get a compiler pass over hibernation. Um, I would like to. Oh, there was there was a question. Well, go ahead. I would like to challenge the, whether uh, this idea is really going to gain you so much because. Um, Iterating over device tree is not what you spend most of the time on, I think. I mean, what, you, what in my experience, what you spend time on is probing like USB devices or well, uh, initializing, loading firmware to some huge chip. Yeah, I, well, um, okay, so I don't, I, I want to make sure I uh, explain that this is not just to eliminate device tree overhead. So device tree overhead on my board is about 130 uh, milliseconds. Um, and it, that could probably be reduced. Some of that is probably print case stuff. But uh, I, it also applies to bus probing, right? So a lot, there, a lot of bus probing, especially USB bus, uh, it takes, you have these uh, uh, standards mandated delays as you're getting what, what are the list of devices on the bus. And it's like, well, I know what the buses are in the, or but, the devices are on the bus. You have to do that. Otherwise, the device doesn't initialize. So uh, how? Well, right. So you have to separate the initialization from right. There is there are issues. There's a lot of huge <laughs> issues here. Wait. So this guy's been waiting for the thing. Go. Uh, okay. So maybe just for the record, uh, with U boot you have the Falcon boot, which is something as you described for running the kernel with pre uh, stored values. So you don't need to. Uh, you store one value of the boot and then use that uh, stored value to boot the kernel faster. Uh, second approach is that in U boot you already have the uh, platform data optimizer, which is taking the device tree for the U boot. It, uh, there is a special Python tool. It extracts it, uh, changes it to the C structure uh, values, and then you just use that precompiled. Uh, code for your faster boot. This is used for very tiny boards, which needs to be like, I don't know, 32 kilobytes for the first touch bootloader. So there is such uh, thing is already okay. implemented in U-Boot. If you would so like to look for like something similar. Yeah, I, w I would love to look at that. What was it called again? Uh, this is called the platform data, plat data. Pl I can plat leave data you. And there's an optimizer inside U-Boot or there something? There is, yes, there is a tool in Python, which is taking the device tree. It's uh, looking on the device tree, extracts what you need, uh, changes it for the uh, structure in C, and then you use that C structures when you compile the code. And then you have the portions of the device tree which are important for your fast boot, and tiny device, you just use it automatically. Okay, La last one, Masami, and then I have one more thing. Yeah, just uh, uh, what's it, doctor? Uh, why, why you uh, need to wait for uh, the, the probing, the bus probing, like a USB bus, bus probing? Uh, because that are, it's a, uh, I think I thought that uh, that is a uh, user space issue. Well, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to get the CAN bus up in under 100 milliseconds, and so yeah, I but wanna, uh, I want to probe for 50 milliseconds. Yeah, but even uh, if it's we, asynchronous, I mean. No, no, we don't. Uh, we can defer that after uh, booting up the, the US uh, user space, and uh, user space will uh, just uh, probe that. Well, I mean, if if the CAN driver is going to be initialized in the kernel, right? Then. Oh yeah. Likely there's all kinds of gotchas that make this impossible, but you know, I thought I'd throw it out there. Yeah, so I mean, you can follow the idea of GKI. You don't have to use a GKI kernel, but make your kernel fully modular, load only the modules you care about for the most immediate needs, and then load the rest later on. Well, yes, I mean, there's always modules, but uh, again, I know for a fact that some of the init calls have, have these timeouts in them while they're waiting for stuff to come back. If they're all driver-related timeouts, then, like, yeah, then think, if you make it I a think module. should be investigated to see if they could be reduced or removed. Yeah, right, just FYI, every Android phone in the past three years or four years, they're fully modular kernels. And almost all of them use parallelized module loading, okay, so, so it's all solved. So you're saying that Android solves this by uh, putting as much stuff in modules as possible? 
we, this is not the intent, but I'm saying the features you're looking for are already there because we did it for other reasons. Okay. But it's there, yeah. Okay, last thing I want to talk about with my, my zero time remaining, <laughs> but we're on a break. I'll, I'm going to, you got to give me. Uh, so uh, I want to be able to uh, give developers a tool to automatically tell them what they've done wrong or what they could improve. And this would just be something that looks at their kernel command line, looks at the loaded modules, and tells them, oh, hey, you know, if uh, uh, determine if you're using clock, if you have clock disable unused in your init calls and it's taking more than zero microseconds, there's actually a kernel command line option that will disable that. So you can trade off a little memory for, uh, uh, or I don't know if it's runtime performance, but I think there's a lot of stuff like that. I think some were mentioned here that there are existing techniques to reduce uh, the overhead of some of these initialization things that are available uh, that we could point people to. That particular uh, command line will cause permanent power impact for the rest of your boot. What? So don't, that particular clock ignore unused, don't do that. You're going to have high power for the rest of the time oh, until see, you reboot why, the. That's why well, no, see, yeah, I would make that a candidate. For, well, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'd make that a candidate for deferred init call. So that's, anyway. Okay, um, I have more stuff. I wanted to talk the same thing as Kasim did, which is what's, there's no boot time maintainer in the kernel. We don't have an ecosystem, really, of boot times, you know, developers, uh, and how we can collaborate. We already had the discussion, though, and we're out of time, so uh, thanks. And you can talk to me in the hallway.